outer critic sabotages intimacy through perfection, unrealistic expectations, perf perfection. Or the outer critic is looking for any imperfection. And the outer critic is uh, projecting an expectation that you deserve safety. You go into a place you just expect safety. Safety isn't because you develop and cultivated long-term relationships. It's just you go into a place, you say you deserve safety, and it comes. If it doesn't, you hold people accountable by setting boundaries and just demanding safety. <laughs> and just testing everybody, constantly shit-testing people to see if they're perfect. That's how the outer critic sabotages intimacy. I am bro broken because of this, so mu something must be fixed. This is very subtle, because this is so common in current attachment theory and everything. It's assuming lack, it's assuming brokenness. Which isn't totally wrong, but if you fall into that and you project the brokenness without testing that it's real, you will self-create that brokenness because your solution of fixing something is going to break something that might not be broken. The outer critic sabotages intimacy. Break something that might not be broken. So the outer critic is like a wall I build to on my outside. But this a is wall. from a non-NARC point of view. NARC does it for different reasons. Uh, what if it's the same thing? Well, it's like, it's like having 12 donuts or one donut. They're really, they're donuts, but they're different. So they are using it as an attack. But the non-NARC yes. non -narc don't use it for that attack. They just use it as a wall. Okay, let's try to do a little intro into Outer Critic. Now I'm learning there's an Outer Critic. And now you can loop between inner critic and outer critic, and the outer critic comes up with all this stuff in your head that blocks you from asking the questions or, you know, trying to figure out the implied meanings or assumptions or whatever, because you have your own insecurities or your own self-limiting beliefs or whatever that's going on inside of you. And so that pushes you away from people. Then you go back, retreat into yourself, and now you got to deal with the inner critic again. Then you go back out into the world, and then, you know, it's a loop. You made these assumptions, these negative assumptions about okay. the people or situation, and then you find out you find a way to validate that in your mind, which mm -hmm. is totally yeah, you not even really, yeah, yeah, it's not, probably it, you know you're probably way off, and now you. So the outer critic is tricky to talk about because sometimes it's like a filter or lens you have that you're projecting, or that's filtering your reality that you don't know or that you have to consciously try to unpack your first read because your first read of things will be tainted by your outer critic. And Pete Walker's angle of the outer critic is to say that the outer critic sabotages intimacy. <laughs> it tries to protect you, but in the process of trying to protect you, it guarantees Isolation, it guarantees a rejection. It continues the pattern. Come back and deal with the inner critic because you pushed it, you know, you're back to isolating. And how does the outer sabotage the inner? Give me some the outer more examples. Creates all these fault, creates all these narratives uh, and, and uh, has all of these views on people that they've just kind of conjured up in their head. So the outer is still in your head, but it's focused outside. They're so projections. So you have projections. Now here's a trap. If you look at the outer and you try to say the outer is the enemy, you've fallen for othering. <laughs> the outer critic and the inner critic are both alloplastic defenses. Alloplastic defenses are sometimes simple described as external defenses. 
But I think that's too specific. You need to generalize and say it's othering defenses. And just like allopathic medicine is othering medicine. You have a disease. It's an invasion. It's an other. Let's surgery the dis disease or treat the symptom. That's an other. Outer critic, it's easy to see. That's the other person. Let me blame that person. Let me help that person. Let me go get lost in the other. But inner critic is also othering because you split yourself into a good and bad, top and down. That's also othering. So some people try to fix the outer critic by going saying, let's go inner critic. Someone tries to fix outer critic by saying external locus of control is bad. Let's go switch to inner locus of control. Both of those are still othering. There is a difference, though. Hmm? There's the a difference. Critic, What's the difference? The inner critic's othering is, is the problem inside you, and the outer critic sees the problem outside. Well, right there. Never did it, both of them By are seeing othering. there's a problem that's othering. No, it's true. It's true. So it's too That's today's to challenge. Have... Is that true? <laughs> that your othering of attacking a part of yourself that worked when you're a child might not be working now as an adult. By you judging that person that defense of yours from the past as bad and needing to be removed, that's othering. That's an alloplastic defense. Whether or not you do it on the outside or the inside, it's still other defensing. It's rejecting something and trying to get rid of it. It's exiling. So let's let's take the word intimacy that Holly used, right? Intimacy is between person A and person B. And I agree, both is othering. But in inner critic, the problem is in A, but in See the right past, there. Your definition is saying that the problem is in something that's othering. Yes. What if the problem but is it, just in the system? It's in the relationship. It's not in any one person in the relationship. It's in the connections between everybody. It's in the harmony and the layout and the structure of everybody. <laughs> it's not in one person. That's scapegoating <laughs> internally. See? <laughs> Isn't that the problem of codependence? They get scapegoated commonly. So when you look inside your inner critic and you try to find who's the scapegoat, then you target and say, that's the scapegoat. Let me exile it. Let me fix it. That's the same thing. I got it. I got it. So you're basically saying the problem is in the connection, not between the two sides of the connection. That's sort of where I'm going. So. You're able to follow, so that's pretty good. This is a very complicated argument I'm trying to make. But let's continue with this, because this has an example. And let's see if people can catch Kay's example, and that's a trigger warning for Brad and anybody else who remember Kay. Her voice might fragment people. <laughs> Jacking or whatever onto other people. Not really they, giving them a chance to know who they are or what they, you know, you're not listening or you're not asking, whatever. In my experience, what I'm seeing. She starts with this and I cut it down to make it more palatable. Otherwise it would have been uh, word salad -y. Even after confronting as people would rather attack you than being vulnerable. This is her outer critic projecting a conclusion of which she forces other people to make it <laughs> to match it so it becomes her reality let's go back to say whatever in my experience what i'm seeing this opener is also outer critic so in my experience, in my perception, in my outer critic projection filter, this is what my outer critic is telling me. This is how I'm perceiving the world. 
And how am I perceiving the world? I'm perceiving the you world. You're not confronting as is confrontational. People would rather attack you than being vulnerable. And I'm perceiving people are attacking me. I'm perceiving the world as dangerous. I'm perceiving people are not perfect. So that's uh, Pete Walker's framing of the outer critic. It projects imperfection outwards and it projects danger outwards. So if I go into people, I go into a new group and then I point out everybody's imperfection. And I treat people like they're attacking me. What's the odds they're going to reflect back what I'm projecting? <laughs> but then my after critic is right. <laughs> I came into a group. I thought it would be dangerous. <laughs> I started challenging and shit testing everybody. And then I got attacked back. <laughs> and then I could say, oh, people would rather attack you than being vulnerable. My outer critic was right. But my outer critic won because it guaranteed uh, intimacy sabotage. <laughs> I'm not able to be intimate because my outer critic is guaranteeing uh, relationship rupture. It's not helping me build bridges. So you do outer critic, inner critic, just doesn't matter. And she's there. Outer critic, inner critic, doesn't matter. I've given up. I'm not even going to try to improve. <laughs> It's so freaking exhausting. It's exhausting. Why is it exhausting? Because she's judging everybody and she sees danger everywhere. No one gets her. Even after talking for an hour, it's so exhausting. Because then Brad started interrogating her. Because Brad fell for her outer critic. That's how <laughs> great it works. All right, I did that once. <laughs> All right. <laughs> We're not going to study that. That was that. my, that was my healing, Matt. Right? That's where the healing was. <laughs> and this is her conclusion. Wherever I can, I minimize commun communication. I would translate this to say, wherever I can, I try not to listen. <laughs> <laughs> or I go into things and I say, they want you for what they want you for and nothing else. They want you for what they want you for and nothing else. They want you for what they want you for and nothing else. They want you for what they want. So I'll go into a room. I want intimacy. I want people to entertain me. And if I don't get it, I will leave and I will minimize communication. What kind of relationships will you have with that attitude? She's not, it's not give and take. It's not a reciprocal relationship because the outer critic is guaranteeing sabotaging intimacy and that's what we'll try to get to part two intimacy wherever i can i minimize communication not really giving them a chance to know who they are wherever i can i minimize communication you know you're not listening or you're not asking i minimize communication to outer critic their projections is an outer critic their projections in my experience their projections what i'm seeing their projections. People would rather attack you than being vulnerable. Their projections. He's an outer critic. Their projections. Wherever I can, I minimize communication. Not really then, giving them a chance to know who they are. You know, you're not listening or you're not asking. He's an outer critic. Their projections. So you're you're projecting. So you have projecting whatever to other people. Because if you dive into Pete Walker, he has a strategy of trying to challenge the outer critic and fight the outer critic. I would argue that's falling into the outer critic. <laughs> so more so, it's just recognizing that there's projections and awareness and just adding perspectives. That's what the outer critic needs. It's not. If you otherize the outer critic or you otherize the inner critic, you're falling into the trap of otherizing, of fragmenting. And that's where Ironically, I discovered this, I, this came to me that uh, Sam Vaknin's serpent voice is describing the outer critic. So we need the individuation or whatever that talk was. All of the pointers are basically the outer critic. Uh, Garden of Eden, for example. Let's look at what the serpent had said. You need to learn new things. Knowledge is, is power. You need to educate yourself. So the outer critic isn't just a critic, 
you could fix people and help people. And that's your outer critic. Because <laughs> you're not holding space for their story. You're just saying, here's a fix to shut you up. Or here's a fix to make me feel good that I'm fixing you. It's, it's othering. I see something in you that needs to be fixed, repaired, removed, surgery, symptom to be treated. I will jump in and invade your system. That's othering. That's the outer critic. But that's most of, most of therapy. That's most of self-help. That's technology. <laughs> Modern society that uses technology. Technology is almost another pointer for alloplastic and allopathy. All of modern technology is trying to take over nature. It's trying to make nature cave to human will. That's why technology is so awesome. We can fly, we can drive, we can multiply resources because of technology. But technology is othering. We're using willpower, smarts to bend nature to our will. But we're losing a systemic point of view of how to be in harmony with nature, how to work within the system as a process. We're just moving content and tweaking content and material to steal all the resources of the world and you know, be grandiose. But it comes at a price. You need to improve. You need to expand your... See, improving... Modern society, I would say, is progress. Progressives. America, it's all about American dream. It's about progress, making progress, growing growth, change, economic GDP. Welcome, Delena. We just started. Try to follow along. There's a chat where you can ask questions. Horizons. What every modern educator is telling today to children. Mm -hmm. The only thing which is a bit jarring, a bit mm -hmm. like out of sync. You're going to be like God. If you were to listen to this voice of the serpent, you would have said, wow, it's a great friend. He wants me to learn. He wants me to educate myself. He wants me. But look at the result. You know? yeah. So you need to isolate the, the serpent in your head from God's voice. Yes. What is God's voice, by the way? The voice of God is silent. Mm. That is you. God is you. Your authenticity, your authentic voice is silent. Mm. Silent. This is the tricky part because silence and boredom and space is threatening to a codependent. <laughs> feels like isolation, feels like depression, feels like grief because when you give yourself space, <laughs> all your shadow crap comes up. So you almost like your outer critic or your serpent voice to keep everything in check. But it's so much work is just a job it's like perfectionism it's there was so much work i wonder i was exhausted all the time there was so much work i wonder i was exhausted all the time there was so there's enough space 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 that's why the flight types have both outer and inner critic because <laughs> they're getting lost in that so much work there was so much work. I wonder I was exhausted all the time. There was so much work. I wonder I was... The outer crit critic is using willpower to try to control nature. Your nature, other people's nature, your life's system's nature, and that's exhausting. But it's adrenaline producing, so more power to you. <laughs> the voice that talks all the time in makes suggestions and masquerades mm. and improves you and mm. that's that's not you mm. that could be society if you work hard you will make money see that society society teaches people allopathic alloplastic othering mindset i control nature i am the cause of the effect my free will is choosing my destiny mm. If you make money, you will have a beautiful house, you'll be happy. And so that's also not you. Mm. Any voice that speaks is usually not you. Any voice that speaks is usually not you. And if you had been exposed to a narcissist, mm. 
he first of all eliminates all the other voices, mm. monopolizes the space, and then the voice that speaks inside you after you had left the narcissist physically mm. is the narcissist. This is uh, the trap. This is the, the, the puzzle that Granin and Vaknin haven't figured out. Or maybe me too. <laughs> the narcissist super, invades your superego. You have a voice. Even after you break up, you still have the narcissist voice in your head. <laughs> We're all screwed. And if you go into self-help and you're ordering yourself around through inner critic or outer critic, it's still the narcissist induction. You must get rid of this voice. It's the serpent. Yeah. You must listen to the voice of God. Yeah. The voice of God is silent. But of course, given the right incentives, God also speaks mm -hmm. to humanity, mm -hmm. to humanity, mm -hmm. to humanity. When push comes to shove and he has a clear message and so on, he speaks. Mm -hmm. Listen to that voice. And the other voice never stops speaking mm -hmm. and masquerades as your friend and masquerades as your friend. The active and if you're lonely and you're isolated and you're depressed, you want a friend. So the voice that speaks with you is a welcome distraction from silence. Because in God's presence, in the fire presence, your self gets burnt away. So it's just you and your vulnerability. Who wants to face that? No one really wants an ego death. You like, you like the idea of it. voice in your head yeah. who is which is the narcissist mm. is going to use all the right language mm. is going to say boundaries mm. is going to say healing it will feed off anything you learn all the techniques and the exercises they're immediately hijacked by the narcissist yeah so if you went to therapy and the therapist taught you to have better boundaries mm. now he's demonizing me as a narcissist i'm trying to generalize it and take away the narcissist charge and say it's simply othering it's simply fragmenting a fragmented perspective of life that's going to guarantee separation and rejection. And then by third act, we'll try to give some tips. Oh, act two. Next thing you know, the narcissist will take these mm. and will render you aggressive. <laughs> Yeah. And conflictive and violent. So you lose all your friends. Yes. You're isolated. Yes. And you're now vulnerable to the next narcissistic yes. relationship. So that's boundaries. Yeah. So you do inner child work. Yeah. So the narcissist will infantilize you. He will use the inner child, he will leverage the inner child <laughs> techniques and so on to infantilize you. Yeah. Everything and you learn can up. and will be used against you by the, this internal voice. If you don't first silence it, silence it, silence it, you will. Now you could silence it by just making space for the silent space of God. If you try to silence it by fighting it, <laughs> by shutting it up, you're trying to exile it and you fall into the trap of othering. Because what you do gets mirrored back to you, so if you're rejecting a part of yourself, then you'll get rejection back. This is a tricky argument feel that you're losing an excellent good friend there's an emotional price for this process mm. Mm. because as you transition from the active voice to the passive voice you will feel very very alone very very alone there's an emotional price for this the narcissist isolates his victims from their support network mm. social network family mm. friends you name it and then he becomes their own their world and so getting rid of a narcissist means getting rid of of the world there's a huge sense of existential loneliness in the transition from the active to the passive voice. There's an emotional price for this. There's an emotional price for this. There's an emotional price for this. So the emotional price is the same thing as saying, Pete Walker is saying, the outer critic sabotages intimacy. Or codependents have terror of intimacy. Or they have terror of being seen, but they also have a des desire to be seen. So they have this sort of weird addiction <laughs> and weird relationship with being seen or being loved. How do we dive into love? Um... 
Okay, here's an example of codependent love. <laughs> Our fantasy. I think this is authentic. I don't want love to be boring. I don't want love to be boring. Because boring is so... ordinary. <laughs> I freaking get it. And if it is boring, how? I haven't had it. How if it's supposed to be this slow, easy thing? That it's not something that I've acquired. How if it's supposed to be this... Something I've acquired. Isn't that sort of languaging that something you own? <laughs> Love is something you own. It's a content. It's a fragment. Do you see how othering works? Or even using language of ownership, of consumerism, of fragmenting things, of controlling things. Solid ground that I've never had it. And it sucks. And it sucks, but how does she know that she doesn't have love? Maybe she's had love and she's rejected inner love. Maybe the virus of othering is looking for problems and creating problems and not seeing the inner love that's underneath. It's not seeing the ordinary, boring relationships that are there that can be invested. Because she's looking for this fantasy. But it's a nice whining. It's better than Gabe's whining. Yeah, yeah but she's pretty, so that's all that matters, right? But track how her hair, her hair keeps changing in this video. <laughs> she has a soft lens like I do. <laughs> a better lighting. You spend your days thinking that there's someone else oh, do you out see? Her sucks. hair was over here. And it sucks big time. You spend your over days here. thinking <laughs> that there's someone else out there who's like you, but really they're they're all with people who are your polar opposites and the same as you all at the same time. What the hell does that mean? <laughs> no one sees me. I'm isolated. Everyone else is in loving relationships. That's the outer critic. See? <laughs> Outer critic is sabotaging intimacy. Whether she got it from a narcissist or just has it, the outer critic creates a filter of seeing the rest of the world without evidence that guarantees sabotaging intimacy. It guarantees isolation. It guarantees you falling for love bombing for the shared fantasy because it's only a fantasy that's going to fit the distorted expectations of the outer critic. Think about when you were younger and what your childhood was like. Where did you escape to? Where did you go? Movies? For me. Everyone's escaping when they're in the childhood? Hmm. It was books. And the thing that makes me. The she same escaped to books. As a narcissist in their fantasy land is that I live in one too. I live in one too. She lives in a fantasy land. I like that ownership. That I think that I should have this world when passionate romance and that things are supposed to be more beautiful than they are and really beauty is found in the ordinary and the mundane. But when you spend your time trying to escape from a reality, escape from a reality that is less than good. That is less than good. What does that mean? Far less than good. Oh, far less than good. That means more. Because it's far less than good. Instead of just less than good. <laughs> far less than okay, far less than fine. Oh, there. Far less than okay, far less than fine. <laughs> that is pure outer critic. It's just saying things are not perfect. See? Far less doesn't mean anything. <laughs> it's not a target. It's just a, this isn't good enough. <laughs> with slightly different language. You find yourself engulfed in books. You find yourself assuming a role, a character. So are you the crooked king? Or are you the lowly peasant who lowly comes in peasant. to save, to save that person? And we assume our roles. Damn, it hurts. <laughs> 
but when you spend your time trying to escape from a reality, damn it hurts. <laughs> So she's othering herself. It hurts, and it's her fault because she's escaping reality. There's no solution because the outer critic is going to put you in a puzzle <laughs> and guarantee sabotaging any intimacy. Because <laughs> all this stuff, do you have? Does anybody have any idea what intimacy is? No. <laughs> or even love is like <laughs> it's just confusing. We'll give you an example. This is what closer to intimacy. <laughs> so I gave you the mind fuck, and I'll try to give you a contrast of something simpler. If it's simpler for you. It was nice to be with someone who actually knew something about me, as opposed to Tinder dates or being set up. I mean, he has seen me at the hospital with no makeup and at your house, not trying to be perky or appealing. What you and Toby have. Isn't that much more relaxed? Isn't that honest? <laughs> There's none of that charge of perfectionism or self-shaming of inner craziness. It's this sort of genuine yearning that's part of love and intimacy that's just human. What I dream of finding is that intimacy. It's letting people see the worst part of you without being scared. It's letting people see the worst part of you without being scared. But shouldn't Toby be able to express his deepest fears without punishment? Isn't that what marriage is? Be able to express his deepest fears without punishment? Without punishment? Express his deepest fears without punishment? If your outer critic is toxified, whoever you're dealing with cannot be real without punishment because you They'll be fixed because they're not perfect. If your inner critic is toxified, also, if you show your real self and you're too human, you'll get punished. That's how it sabotages intimacy. Even when Richard Grant is talking about terror of intimacy, the outer critic comes in. Let's see if anybody catches this. This is advanced. What about fear of intimacy? my hypothesis with codependence this is new that we actually are terrified of intimacy because we never knew love so your first model for a loving relationship in adulthood would have been the relationship with your parents but if they never really loved you so the intellectualizing of blaming your childhood and your parents is veering into the territory of othering I am bro broken because of this, so mu something must be fixed. This is very subtle, because this is so common in current attachment theory and everything. It's assuming lack, it's assuming brokenness. Which isn't totally wrong, but if you fall into that and you project the brokenness without testing that it's real, you will self-create that brokenness because your solution of fixing something is going to break something that might not be broken. But it's satisfying, satisfying to come up with a nice excuse and a nice story. But that can fall into othering. That falls into outer critic, inner critic alloplastic de defense, othering type mindset. They never really loved you. They just only showed you time and attention transactionally, depending on when you were given them what they wanted. Authentic love will be completely alien. So if somebody loves you just for you, you'll be like, what? what's this? Is this boring experience, this weird, dull, experience I'm going through, which a lot of people complain about. They find a normal person who loves them and then they're bored. So boring, Stacy. Mm. <laughs> yes, boring. Keep going. I know. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to tell you. It's boring. See? A little, little excitement. Yeah. See, that's an authentic expression of a codependent who maybe likes the 
rejection, likes the trauma, likes the addictive quality of push-pull. Or maybe that's all they know, and that's not necessarily bad. It just needs to be integrated into a better working relationship. But if you just reject the boring, or reject the excitement, and try to force yourself to have a boring relationship, <laughs> othering the part of you that likes the exciting part, you're fragmenting yourself to try to heal. What kind of fucked up strategy is that? So you're looking for the, the game, which is to be transactional, which is like, what do I need to do to win a piece of love? And if they go, no, I love you unconditionally, they're basically saying, oh, that game you want to play, that's all off the table now. And you go, well, but also, you don't believe it. You, you can't it's believe it. You can't believe it. 100%. No, you're terrified of the intimacy. It has nothing to do with your belief. That's a little closer, but then why are you terrified of intimacy? That'd be a better question, but I was novice or wasn't paying attention. What's driving the terror, outer critic? But what's underneath the outer critic? Why do you feel unworthy? Where did you buy into this story that you're broken? Maybe you're buying into that you're broken too much. Maybe you're only half broken. Maybe other people are broken. Maybe society's broken. Maybe being human is broken. Well, I think when uh, we learn through our lives that with love uh, comes abuse. Abuse is also othering. Is a child totally helpless? Babies maybe are just as manipulative. It's a system. No, you were foundational. Richard, didn't you say, as a child, you're groomed? Yeah, I think if your first loving relationship is, is transactional, and yeah, if, as Stacey says, if it's dangerous as well, like if the, if, the trans, if the game is, if you play it well, you'll receive not love, but time and attention. But if you fuck up, you'll get slapped physically or emotionally. Then that creates adrenaline. Then you're like, oh, the stakes in this game are high. That's how people get addicted to gambling. And let's make no mistake about it. Those of us who are raised in abusive environments, every time the front door closed because your abusive parent came home, that was a gamble. That was a gambling moment. Will it land on red or black today? Let's see. So th I think that's where uh, the addiction, like gambling and, and that kind of activity, it really appeals to people raised in, uh, in nasty uh, childhood conditions. Yeah, that sounds exciting. The way I just described it, yeah, some of you looked high, excited. Every... Every single yeah. moment matters. You could die. Right. That's like really exciting. Yeah. There's a certain intensity of experience, but I'm then we say, yeah, but then we turn around and say, I want a nice stable relationship with somebody who loves me. And then you get Shallow there and you trauma. go, this feels right. it's alien and dull. Yes. Boring. Alien and dull. Boring. Alien and dull. Boring. So you go into a secure attachment or a therapist and they try to force you into a boring relationship that goes against your core. <laughs> How is that healing? Yeah. Is this supposed go. to be healing? Is this supposed go. to be healing? Is this supposed go. to be healing? Is this boring interactions where everyone's anger, angry about anger, everyone's conflict averse and no one can express themselves. What kind of boring life is that? So how's everyone following? Is anyone lost? Is anyone keeping up? Is anyone bored? <laughs> That's all that matters. Is it entertaining? <laughs> no, it is interesting. That's something else. So that's the downside of othering. Othering is dehumanizing. And it's boring. It's lifeless. There's a muscle to make things interesting. There's a muscle to create positive tension, negative tension, push-pull flirting. And othering alloplastic de defenses 
your outer critic, it kills intimacy, it kills life, it kills libido, it kills eroticism. Where to go now? Let's go back to outer critic. Whose fault, is it? Whose fault is it? How many of you are blamers? So here's an example of outer critic. Brene Brown is a great storyteller. How many of you, when something goes wrong, the first thing you want to know is whose fault it is? Hi, my name is Brene. I am a blamer. <laughs> Let me just tell you this quick story. I'm in my house. I have on white slacks and a pink sweater set. And I'm drinking a cup of coffee in my kitchen. It's a full cup of coffee. I drop it on the tile floor. It goes into a million pieces, splashes up all over me. And the first, I mean, a millisecond after it hit the floor. A millisecond. Look at her impulsive go-to outer critic. What does she do? What does her outer critic plant into her head? Right out of my mouth is this. Damn you, Steve. Damn you, Steve. Instant because... So much easier to offload pain than yeah. to feel pain. Offload pain than yeah. to feel pain. So much easier to offload pain than yeah. to feel pain. Millisecond, because her outer critic is hyper fast and hyperactive. So here's the background of how she came to this conclusion. Just turn my clip there. <laughs> Your clip? <laughs> uh, is it offload pain and feel it? Oh. That was you massive, that. Mike. Hey, Kurt, blame Steve too. Yes, let's all blame on the Steve bandwagon. What do you think he did? <laughs> While you're pre-blaming him, <laughs> what was his actual offense? <laughs> because let me tell you how fast this works for me. So Steve plays water polo with a group of friends. And the night before, he went to go play water polo. And I said, hey, make sure you come back at 10, because, you know, I can never fall asleep into your home. And he got back, like, at 10.30. She said 10 o'clock. He got back at 10.30. And so I went to bed a little bit later than I thought. Ergo, my second cup of coffee that I probably would not be having had he come home when we discussed. Therefore. And so the rest of that story is I'm cleaning up um, the kitchen. Steve calls, caller ID. I'm like, hey. <laughs> He's like, hey, what's going on, babe? <laughs> what's going on? Um, <laughs> so I'll tell you exactly what's going on. <laughs> I'm cleaning up the coffee that spilled all... Dude, like <laughs> Isn't that great? Steve hung up. He knew what was coming. <laughs> like dial tone. <laughs> Because he knows. How many of you go to that place when something bad happens, the first thing you want to know is whose fault is it? Whose fault is it? Whose fault is it? Isn't that what happens in these groups, support groups? Who's your narcissist? You're sad, you're angry, whatever. Here's a fix. Let me go find a cause to fix some symptom that you don't like. Where is this? fault. Where's the blame? That's outer critic, inner critic, othering for breaking things up into a cause and effect frag fragmented perspective and not looking at the full system, not questioning our impulsive read, not exploring the relationship, not taking the time to evaluate things. Blame is simply the discharging of discomfort and pain. So much easier it has to offload pain than yeah. to feel pain. Offload pain than yeah. to feel pain. 
I took out the accountability part because her definition is kind of whacked. <laughs> An inverse relationship with accountability. And blaming is very... I would say, take away accountability and say responsibility. So when you... And then not just say responsibility, yours or the other. Shared responsibility. Systemic responsibility. That's a bit more of a muscle to get the right amount of responsibility for you, other person, and the group to coordinate to have the most better and active response. <laughs> response ability, the ability to respond. And then the skill of responding skillfully better to address the problem, to fix the system, to build stronger relationships through the ability to respond, responsibility. Versus blaming somebody, scapegoating them, and then throwing people away. Very corrosive in relationships, and it's one of the reasons we miss our opportunities for empathy. Because when something happens and we're hearing a inverse well, even relationship there, with accountability, right and blaming is very corrosive. So blaming is now othered in relationships. And it's one of the reasons we miss our opportunities for empathy. And then empathy is what's supposed to replace blaming. This is still an othering mindset. She's just going to take empathy and turn it into blaming and offloading pain. So much easier to offload pain than yeah. to feel pain. Offload pain than yeah. to feel pain. Or she'll just find something new to hate. We hate you! We hate like we anxiety. Hate <laughs> we hate you. 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 She can't get away from blame. <laughs> she can relabel accountability, empathy, whatever. But othering, outer critic, that's her go to to offload pain. Because when something happens and we're hearing a story, we're not really listening. We're in the place where I was making the connections as quickly as we can about whose fault something was, whose fault something was, whose fault something was. Who's at fault? Who's to blame? Who to fix? Who to scapegoat? Essentially, isn't that what the argument is? Ooh, 845. There's no time. There's no solution. We are all doomed. You cannot have trust and consistency and recognize patterns because I can't present that in 15 minutes. It's just hopeless. <laughs> Debbie's I'm fighting all your time because we need the solution. We need the fix. We can't go on all week. What are we going to do? No, 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 no. <laughs> Who's to blame here? Yeah. Time. Time is to blame. Time yeah. is to blame. Yeah, yeah. No, it's Dave's fault. Oh, don't you get it? Let's play Steve. 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 You played polo. You messed up everyone's schedule. Yeah. They do leave no, the life, though. Oh, yes, he was out. He was out. Polo is the sport of kings, right? So, you know, they're living the dream. Fuck Steve. I don't know if I want to fuck him. Perhaps he's uh, boring. He has Brene's measure. I respect him. He's codependent, so I think he's boring. So, Outer Critic presents sabotages intimacy um, through perfection, unrealistic expectations, perf perfection. Or the outer critic is looking for any imperfection. And the outer critic is uh, projecting an expectation that you deserve safety. You go into a place you just expect safety. Safety isn't because you develop and cultivated 
long-term relationships. It's just you go into a place, you say you deserve safety, and it comes, and if it doesn't, you hold people accountable by setting boundaries and just demanding safety. <laughs> and just testing everybody, constantly shit-testing people to see if they're perfect. That's how the outer critic sabotages intimacy. So, to flip it, you need a positive aim of what intimacy or love looks like. Because if you're letting your outer critic in society's outer critic, in self-help and therapy's inner critic, outer critic, inner critic, tell you what intimacy is, it's going to be saying safety that you just deserve <laughs> by setting boundaries. And uh, perfection. People shouldn't fight. People should just talk things out or conflict aversion. So perfection is going to demand perfection and it's going to just demand safety. But perfection and safety is something that is cultivated, that's nurtured, that comes out of relationships that are healthy. That's an after effect after you have an embedded, consistent building of trust and trusting patterns of interaction. Then you have the reward of safety and perfection. You're going towards more perfection, perfected relationship because people are consistent with each other, which develops trust. And then you have patterns of interaction, so people are familiar, and you trust people's patterns. But building this up is boring because it takes time and it's predictable and it's ordinary. <laughs> but let's see how we can present it. Here's three steps. People like steps. Outer critics like steps. So. There is a flow to intimacy. That is into me you see. Here I am. Here is me. Here is what I'm into. That is intimacy. Now, what we often try to do is accelerate the process of intimacy. Codependence. Let me have it now. That's part of, I want safety now. That's part of the outer critic's endangerment and urgency. I want it now. And we're so desperate to connect with someone. We're so lonely. We feel so little value in of, in of ourselves that we have to get it validated through someone else. And what happens when we accelerate the process of intimacy is we plow through the first three steps to try to get known by someone that hasn't proven that they're safe or trustworthy. We get hurt. Because who accepts you when you overshare and you plow through intimacy? Unhealthy, mentally ill people or narcissists. They're the ones that <laughs> say, oh, oversharing. Let's fall in love. Let's get married. Let's have kids. Normal, boring people would say that's a bit too fast. <laughs> we get hurt. Maybe you need to stop, slow down, and take some time in the first three steps. Build safety with someone. Where you genuinely feel safe. You feel safe to be yourself, to communicate, to... So one, build safety for you people that still have outer critics. <laughs> build safety. Don't just demand safety. Like, you know. Be more fucking constructive. Be more... Someone say it right now. Someone say it right now. Someone say it right. Just to really attack right now. Just I'm sorry, you're not being helpful to me right now. Being helpful to me right now. Like you're attacking me, attacking me. Like that is fucking terrifying. That was a bit more courageous. That, was, that is fucking terrifying. That is fucking terrifying. Ah. That, that is fucking. T so you can bully people into safety, but that's not safety. <laughs> that's bullying. That's. What toddlers do. This is what toddlers do. They throw tantrums when reality doesn't play out in the way they think it will. This is what toddlers do. They throw tantrums when reality doesn't play out in the way they think it will. You build safety by building a relationship, getting to know people, bantering, 
spending time with people, not oversharing and bleeding all over people. Do that, you know, later. Or do it over time. <laughs> Let your guard down to be vulnerable, to relax. Then the next step is trust. You take the time to consistently get to know someone, watch their patterns, and identify that they have a trustworthy character. Trust. Patterns over time. Evaluate character. Someone that you know that's proven themselves through patterns. I would look for people who have character when they're stressed, when you're needed, when they're needed, when it counts, not when things are easy. They are a trustworthy person. And then there's vulnerability. Once we know that this person is safe and they are trustworthy, then we can be vulnerable. Then we can share and reveal some things that we don't, we don't just share with everyone on the street. We don't share in a crowded room of strangers. We don't share with our coworkers or our colleagues or anything like that. We're vulnerable. This is vulnerable information. But we feel okay doing it because we've vetted. There's safety and trust. Now we can be vulnerable. And when there's safety and there's trust and there's vulnerability, that's what leads to intimacy. Safety, trust, gradual vulnerability leads to intimacy. There's a progress, a progression of a linear formula for your outer critic. Not perfect, but entertaining a little. This one's a bit more entertaining, but it might be a bit too uh, toxic positivity. But we'll see. It's about consistency, and the same with the relationship. It's not about the events. It's not about intensity. It's about consistency. I'm trying to reframe consistency, are boring and dull, into consistency. <laughs> it's a very hard sell for codependence. Because love bombing in intensity is much more exciting, yes. But <laughs> the fabric of love, of relationships, is consistency. So you don't have to use all this extra energy to keep chasing or your addict whatever uh, love bombing nonsense it's about consistency she didn't fall in love with you because you remembered her birthday and bought her flowers on valentine's day she fell in love with you because when you woke up in the morning you said good morning to her before you checked your phone she fell in love with you because when you went to the fridge to get yourself a drink, you got her one without even asking. She fell in love with you because when you had an amazing day at work and she came home and she had a terrible day at work, you didn't say, yeah, 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 but let me tell you about my day. You sat and listened to her awful day and you didn't say a thing about your amazing day. This is why she fell in love with you. I can't tell you exactly what day, and it was no particular thing you did. It was the accumulation of all of those little things Accumulation of little things builds into something consistent and it's something solid. But that's not a fantasy, that's not instant, that's uh, kind of boring. <laughs> but it's stable because it's built on a foundation. That she woke up one day and it's as if she pressed a button, she goes, I love him. It's about consistency. It's about consistency. When you feel that someone has your back. When you, you, you know that the day that you admit you can't do it, someone will be there and say, I got you, you can do this. That's what gives you the courage to do the difficult thing. So someone having your back, someone that you can trust, someone that you can let your guard down, or someone that you can be real with, that is maybe something foreign to codependence because you grown up in backstabbing, scapegoating environments. <laughs> but if you're using backstabbing, scapegoating strategies to control your inner world, your inner critic becomes your outer critic, and you're using scapegoating and backstabbing strategies in your outer relationships.
So that continues the pattern of repetition compulsion of never having secure attachment or stable relationships. But then therapy will say, you have anxious attachment or avoidant attachment. You're broken. You need to go become secure. So <laughs> they still keep you in the trap of othering. It's not going off to an ashram by yourself somewhere for four weeks and coming back and finding the car. It's not what happens. It's the relationships that we foster. It's the people around us who love us and care about us and believe in us. And when we have those relationships, we will find the courage to do the right thing. So you have the relationships and then you have the group that has an invader who comes in. I'm just whining. I'm just whining. I'm just whining for nothing. I'm just whining. Guys, I'm asking a question. Guys, I'm asking. I'm sorry. You guys are reading into stuff. I'm sorry. You guys are reading into stuff. Is this supposed go. to be healing? Is this supposed to be more fucking constructive? Be more fucking constructive. Be more fucking constructive. And the group has consistency with each other and they defend the group and then the group gets blamed for swarming it was savage <laughs> sorry so the group has trust <laughs> so the group likes the group and then it sees an invader then it swarms on the invader because that's what love and consistency is supposed to do And that's not just from Gabe. It's pretty much every time some bad actor came and the group stood up to the bad actor, there's usually a couple people that attack the group for doing it. <laughs> or judge the group. Because consistency and family trust is foreign. We don't trust it. Or we're scared of the bully. Our unconscious patterns will side with the bully. We're not, instead of saying, there and say, I got gotcha. you, you can do this. Instead of encouraging people for stepping out and doing the right thing to care about the group, people so doubt because outer critic, outer critic's job is sabotaging intimacy. It's autopilot. It's not even conscience. It's not even a conscious drive. So I'm not pointing it out to try to give it out or critic, but I'm just saying this is a pattern. <laughs> and this is why it's hard to learn how to have uh, teamwork and a trust because whenever that happens and a crybaby comes in, this is what toddlers do. They throw tantrums when reality doesn't play out in the way they think it will. This is what toddlers do. They throw tantrums when reality doesn't play out in the way People they think it will. This is what toddlers do. They throw tantrums when reality doesn't play out in the way they think it will. This is what toddlers do. They throw tantrums when reality doesn't play out in the way they think. Because standing up to a toddler feels like you're beating up a kid, a baby, and that feels like child abuse. Yeah. <laughs> but this is an adult group. And if you act like a toddler and you go against the norms, you get rejected or judged or called out. That's what gives you the courage to do the difficult thing. It's not going off to an ashram by yourself somewhere for four weeks and coming back and finding the courage. It's not what happens. It's the relationships that we foster. It's the people around us who love us and care about us and believe in us. And when we have those relationships, we will find the courage to do the right thing. It's about consistency. So the courage comes after the relationships. This is another those relationships. We will find the courage to do the right thing. So therapy is fragmented. Science is fragmented. So it says courage comes at the end. If I just make you believe you have the courage, I can shortcut the skill. I can shortcut you having a group. So I will force myself to have courage or I will listen to narcissists who fake courage <laughs> and try to copy a narcissist who has courage by bullying people, which is most of the wounded healers. They're going to teach you fake it till you make it. They don't actually have the courage or their courage is because they're bullying people. 
Set boundaries by bullying people. That's the courage they're modeling. They're not saying it, but that's their behavior they're teaching, they're doing. That's why they don't have relationships. They're trying to copy the people. They're using science, and they say, oh, well, the people who have relationships, they have courage, they have blah, 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 blah. I will bully my way to the result. But I, but they're skipping the building of a relationship. They're skipping being vulnerable. They're skipping putting skin in the game, being in the arena. Even Brene Brown has that big arena poem, <laughs> being in the arena, blah, blah, blah. But you have to be in the arena with other people, and other people have to prove themselves by having your back when it counts. And that doesn't happen in codependence groups. That doesn't happen in therapy. When someone has trauma. No, actually the trauma is when you realize that nobody gives a fuck. I don't know how to. So one, you're disturbing me. And two, you're making me feel incompetent. Fuck you. I don't know how to. So one, you're disturbing me. And two, you're making me feel incompetent. Fuck you. So if people are traumatized, what if their wound is that they have no one who has their back? It's not the trauma. That was my trauma. When I had trauma, I tried to talk it out, and other people silenced me, or they couldn't take it. I could read their emotions. So I had to self-silence and self-isolate, because I couldn't share my trauma. I couldn't put it into words. I couldn't uh, make sense of it. If I had someone who had my back or someone who I could vent to or ex make sense of it, then my trauma would naturally heal. If I go to a therapist and try to tra explain my trauma, the trauma will flood them because a lot of it's nonverbal. Then they're going to traumatize me with their trauma. And I have to pay. It's even, yeah, what is this fucked up shit? I'm absorbing their trauma and I have to pay. And I have to do all the work to try to explain my trauma and then get run over by their fucking trauma. <laughs> and everything's fucking trauma now. <laughs> it's just trust. It's just intimacy. It's just human to human. We're pathologizing, pathologizing humanity. Relationships. That was an interesting segue. <laughs> okay, we went over a little. Five minutes. Try to wrap it up. Who's traumatized? Who's inspired? Who's confused? Is anybody entertained? Ah, uh, boring. <laughs> Farhad, were you able to keep up? Were you expecting anything like this? <laughs> yeah, I really love it. It goes back, I know people don't like what I'm saying, but it's about being with another person without doing anything. That's like, love it. It's being with another person without doing anything, holding Auto space, but it's also uh, the ability to be, to be passionate and care about shit <laughs> and sharing that. Yes, you don't have to do anything to show your passion. See, but we are, we have been poisoned, not by our, just our parents, but the society that we have to keep doing stuff, you know, but so like being compassion with another person, you don't have to do anything. You just sit. Uh, well, you sit and you have presence. You try to. Be with a well, person. that's what I mean. 
So that is a, a skill a that can be developed. Thank you. But maybe when you're silent, that's a good pointer. If you're silent with the right vibe, the right energy, you're holding the space of God's silence for somebody else. Well, when I say silent, I don't mean being tuned out. I mean being silent. <laughs> I mean being silent and being vulnerable, you know. So, so because well, that's you can being vulnerable I, is being in yeah. that space of silence, right? Of I mean, holding yeah, uncertainty exactly and holding presence. Doing. So it's a it's a non doing or it's an active type of silence. Act of it's being. A, it's an interaction. Yes. Yes, God's silence. Yes. Because isn't that like uh, Quakers or Shakers? They have this sort of shared silence and then people are supposed to try to speak from that silence or when they're inspired. Because sometimes it's too hard to hold God's silence by yourself. So having a group or people that you know that can hold that God's silence as a collective. So, but there is one thing we have, I think, like I like to make emphasis, part, part of this hatred for silence, it comes from modern society. Because we have to keep fixing shit, you know. Modern yeah, so society cannot... is technology, it's yes. othering, it's yes. using willpower to control and, dis and reshape nature, yes. So it's not just my trauma, but also technology. But right now, you're othering. <laughs> That's true. You're finding something to blame and something to fight against, which is othering. So we'll try to close with a pointer back to what the bigger picture is. And this is a tricky thing, but maybe this will be a nice close. But actually, what unconditional love is being without condition. I'm going to be with myself without condition. I'm going to be with myself because I'm here. Not because I want to accomplish something or because I'm a good guy. I'm going to be with myself because I'm here. Love is a very, it's such an overused word that we don't really know what it means. And so I like the word evolve because evolve and love are, are so similar. They could be the same words. They actually even have the same letters and everything. When I say I love myself, it's like saying I allow myself every opportunity to evolve. I don't interfere with myself. I do my best to give myself every opportunity to evolve. And when I, Right there, let's see. Same letters and everything. When I say I love myself, it's like saying I allow myself every opportunity to evolve. Give yourself permission. Brene Brown says like, give yourself a post-it of permission slip. I don't interfere with myself. I do my best to give myself every opportunity to evolve. And when I'm that way with myself, and I see that my life experience is a valid opportunity for, in which for me to evolve, then I'm going to be that way with other people around me. I'm going to allow them to evolve as what's required for them. And I don't know what's required for them. I don't even know what's required for me. So I've been less likely to interfere with them. Those that don't interfere with me are those that truly love me. There are others that try to love me through their interference, but that's only because they're interfering with themselves. Interference with themselves and other people is othering, is outer critic, inner critic. If you hang around groups of people and therapists and mentors, all they know is interference. You slowly learn the mindset of interference, of conditional love, of othering, of fragmenting. of narcissism, of scapegoating. And then you just... I have a guard up for sure. 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 You take this armor off, we die. We die. 
we die. You take this armor off, we die. We die. We die. You take this. Do you have to inject yourselves into everything? 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 Well, that was the problem with intimacy. Codependence overshare. And they try to force intimacy. It's the wrong balance. The bridge isn't built. And it guarantees sabotaging intimacy. <laughs> it guarantees isolation. <laughs> Outer critic is in control. Your inner toxified superego from your parents is still running the show. That's why it's a hard topic. <laughs> it's pervasive. And the support groups reinforce it, even if, mm. yeah, even this one. Because we can't do this. Which was a simple pointer. It was nice to be with someone who actually knew something about me, as opposed to Tinder dates or being set up. I mean, he has seen me at the hospital with no makeup and at your house not trying to be perky or appealing. What you and Toby have, what I dream of finding, is that intimacy. The context is that she's angry at Toby. So she's <laughs> That's why she's responding with the weird look. <laughs> it's letting people see the worst part of you without being scared. It's letting people see the worst part of you without being scared. But shouldn't Toby be able to express his deepest fears without punishment? Isn't that what marriage is? Be able to express his deepest fears without punishment? Without punishment? Express his deepest fears without punishment? Without punishment is the outer critic, the inner critic. Setting boundaries. I'm going to leave unless you do what I want. We're using punishment, self-hatred. Never again. To, for containment. <laughs> We're trying to shortcut containment. Instead of, build, instead of slowly building healthy containment through community and relationships. We're shortcutting containment through punishment. Self-hatred. Shit testing. And that's not, that's containment, that's work. It's not containment, that's a collective uh, support. <laughs> Some Somebody that has your back or the group that has your back that you can let your guard down <laughs> in the culture, the bigger culture. So you have a sense of, I'm home. I can be myself. I can take off the masks. Mm. I can drop all the roles. All the identities. Identities. Yeah. Sounds nice. Yes, doesn't exist. Sorry. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I tried. Yeah, that was that was a big one for me. Um, um, with that with that uh, video of of um, slamming the doors of the kitchen, mm. and then Iman was really backing me up and supporting me. I, at least that was my feeling. So I was not alone, and that was for the first time in my life I was standing up, and someone was there too. Yeah. See, I've, that feeling of not being alone or having some backup, yeah. that's containment. Yeah. I sit on both sides of that one. 